my tree is up and my house is decorated and I am in full-blown holiday mode. So I hope you come along with me in this video as I sew this adorable holiday gift box quilt. For this quilt, you will need just a few things. You will need a layer cake, which is a pre-cut that is 10 inch squares, but they usually come in either 40 or 42 pieces. You will need 40 for this quilt. So just make sure that you have at least 40. Some brands come with like junior layer cakes that only have 20 in them. So you'll probably need to buy two of those. I used a layer cake called Eat, Drink, and Be Ugly, which has ugly sweaters and little martini glasses all over it. It's super cute. And for the background fabric, I used an Essex linen metallic yarn dyed. I hope I'm getting those <laughs> that name right. Um, but it's a beautiful kind of shimmery metallic uh, fabric, and it made a really nice little sashing and border for this quilt. I've already printed out my pattern, and I have my fabric ready to go, so let's jump into making blocks. The easiest way to make these blocks is by doing two at a time because two of your fabrics are going to be shuffled a little bit and so just cutting all the fabric for two makes it a little easier to organize. So I have my fabrics set up here. I have two kind of similarly colored fabrics for the background of the box, like the actual box fabric. And then I have two kind of contrasting colors picked out for the kind of bow and ribbon that will go on the box. So the first set of fabrics I'm going to cut are for the box A variation in the pattern. So I am going to cut these two 10 inch squares into four five inch squares. Now we need to cut our ribbons and bows. So the other two squares for the block are also cut identically to each other. So I have them just carefully stacked up and I am going to cut them up. The cutting diagrams for the ribbons and bows for this block A variation are in the pattern. And I'm just using my ruler to cut these since they are relatively small pieces and it's um, easy to fit them under my ruler here. I cut two two inch by 10 inch rectangles and then a two and a half inch rectangle that I sub cut into two and a half inch squares and one small two inch square. And then I cut the um, two inch by 10 inch rectangles in half to make the four five inch pieces that will form the ribbon portion of the blocks. So I'm gonna set the squares aside for just a moment and let's assemble the kind of basic building blocks of our block. I have my background box pieces and my ribbon pieces. And now remember, there are two fabrics in each of these. So I'm gonna have this little Eat, Drink, Be Merry with a red ribbon and this little atomic thing with the blue ribbon. If you would prefer to switch them, then definitely do. So back to the squares. Now we have the same fabrics kind of stacked on top of each other. What we wanna do is swap them. So I want to have a red center on my blue ribbon and a blue center with the red ribbon. And now these pieces, these squares, are gonna form our little bow triangles. So I'm also gonna swap them and set them to the side. We are going to be snowballing these onto two corners of our squares. Now you just need to choose which squares are gonna get the little tiny bow triangles. And I have been doing them kind of opposite from each other, but you could also do them next to each other, however you like. The diagram in the pattern, I think, shows them all opposite, but if you would prefer to put them next to each other, then by all means, it is your quilt. Do what makes you happy. I am gonna grab these two red squares, and I'm going to put one on this square and one on this square. So when I say snowball these corners, what I mean is that we are going to put this square in the corner of the larger square. And then we're gonna draw a line from the corner to the opposite corner of this smaller square. So because this line is on the back of your fabric, you can use whatever pen you feel most comfortable with. I have this one just right here. It's not even a friction pen, which is what I usually use, but it won't be seen. So be sure to draw your diagonal line this way on your pieces rather than drawing it this way, which if you sewed on that line, you wouldn't really be able to open it and get a new block. So be sure that your ruler is just covering one corner of your accent fabric. It shouldn't be across your background fabric at all. 
So now that we have our lines drawn, let's talk about where we should sew. And I know that all of the snowball tutorials out there just say to sew on the line. And that's true. You do want to sew on the line, but you want to sew just a thread width to the outside of that line. Now the reason I do this is because there is a little bit of fabric that gets used up when you fold that fabric back on itself when we're done stitching and press it. That seam does take up a little bit of room. I'm going to move my seam guide out of the way since I need a little extra room here and I'm going to put my needle down and I'm going to line my needle up with just just off the tip of that diagonal line. So here is my sewn line. You can see my original line is marked in pen and then you can see my thread path that is just a little bit towards this excess corner and that is going to allow me to press this open and have it be nice and square. So now that it is sewn, you can trim off the excess fabric in this corner. Now you could put it down and use a rotary cutter and cut like that perfect quarter inch seam allowance or you can just lop it off with some scissors. As long as you cut and leave yourself more than a quarter of an inch, it's going to be fine. So it's time to press this corner open. Now when you do that, this is a kind of bias edge that we have just cut into our square. It is stabilized somewhat with stitching, but the stitching is going in the same direction. So if you really yanked on this, you can feel a little bit of give in it. So when you press it, press down to set that seam and then just use your fingers. The fabric will be warm enough that you'll be able to use your fingers just to kind of press it down and it will probably stay in place pretty well. And then you can just press down again to really set that block into shape. So there we go. We have a perfect snowballed corner and it's not just a little bit too small and it will fit right back in with our other blocks. So I'm going to go ahead and finish snowballing this other block unit and then once I'm done with that I'm going to snowball the units for the block that is kind of our second layer. Because remember we have this one block on top that has the atomic, the blue ribbon, and the red bow. But we have this under block that has the eat, drink, and be merry red ribbon and a blue bow. So this square will get the blue ribbon. And then it'll be a time to chain piece our blocks together. Now that our snowball corners are all done, you can see I have both sets of them stacked up here. It is time to chain piece these blocks together. When I chain piece, whether it is two blocks like I have here or a stack of 40 blocks like I might have with a large quilt, I always work in the same order and using kind of the same routine. And using that routine is what helps me stay organized. And so here's what I do. So I lay out all of my blocks and then I sew this seam, which is the seam in the first row between the first unit and the second unit. I pick them up, bring them over to my machine, and I sew them. Right sides together, send it through the machine. And then I press all of those seams and then I put them back. And working that one seam at a time helps me not have all of my blocks kind of jumbled together. So I want them to all come out looking correct and not have to rip and re-sew anything. And so I'm going to do this little stack right here, press it and return it, and then I will do this seam. And I'm gonna work down and then over. So you'll see it, it'll be sped up, but let's chain piece. Let me move my seam guide back into place. These seams are short enough that I'm not going to bother with pins. They're all just a couple of inches long, but if you would prefer to pin, then definitely do. Now let's talk about pressing direction. Usually I press all my seams open, but this block is fairly simple. This seam is pressed this way, and this seam I'm going to press this way towards the ribbon side and that will allow all of my seams to nest when I sew these rows together. Mm -hmm. 
Now that we finished our block A's, it's time to do the block B variation. Now, almost everything on the block B is the same as block A. It's just the proportions and the cutting schematics are a little bit different. So instead of cutting our background fabrics into four equal squares, we're gonna cut them into kind of unequal sizes so that the bow is a little more offset. The cutting directions are all in the pattern. So I'm gonna time lapse through the construction of this since it is almost identical to the block A, but um, I did my quilt about 50-50, so I did make a lot of these block Bs. finished piecing all of my blocks and I have them all laid out and ready to assemble into the final quilt top. Now I do want to take just a moment to talk about cutting your sashing pieces and waiting to do that until you have pieced at least a few blocks because layer cakes, I know they say 10 inch square on the package, but that's not always exactly true. So you see how the edge of your layer cake squares have this little zigzag pinked edge? Some manufacturers measure that 10 inches from the inside of that zigzag, and some measure it from the outside of the zigzag. Or you may have a hand cut layer cake, like if you're using scraps or you bought it from um, a reseller who cuts up their own yardage and creates pre-cuts. That all being said, 10 inches it might not be exact. And that means that when you cut up your layer cake and sew it back together, there might be a little variation in the size of your finished block. If you started with exactly 10 inches, then your block is probably gonna end up at 10 and a half inches. Now, my layer cake happened to be on the larger side, and so it is closer to 11 inches. So before you cut all of your strips to 10 and a half inches, and then end up with 11 inch blocks, go ahead and make a few blocks and measure them and then cut your sashing strips to match. I'm at that point now, so I'm going to assemble the rows of my quilts, alternating uh, my gift box blocks with sashing. And then I will sew the rows together with the long pieces of sashing between the rows. For the quilting on my quilt, I chose to do this really adorable kind of string light pantograph. For holiday quilts, especially one that has kind of a lot of loud prints in it, I really like to do something simple like an all over. And I just started doing pantographs, so I've been kind of into them lately. This string light is from Urban Elements and it was a lot of fun to do. It went really quickly and it was really easy to follow. So um, I think I'll be using this again in the future. I used a matching thread to my background fabric for the quilting of this quilt. And uh, you can see the sparkles in that background fabric a little bit better in this view than you did in the piecing videos. I set up my domestic machine for quilting by swapping out my traditional foot for my hopping foot and then applying my Supreme slider. If you haven't ever tried this, it's definitely worth the investment. It's just kind of a slightly tacky surface that attaches to your machine and it provides this really nice slick surface for your fabric to kind of slide along while you're quilting. It really reduces any drag that you have when you are free motion quilting. I also stuck my gloves on, which again, are a, a very inexpensive investment to make and will really help you manage the movement of your fabric under the needle. Whenever I begin quilting, I always take just a few seconds to perform a little tension test on the side of my project. And whether I'm on a long arm or a domestic, I always do this. It just takes a second and it just allows you to really gauge if your stitches are coming out the way that you want them to. I don't want any loops on the back or little nests or any problems when I'm quilting. And I certainly don't want to have to rip out stitches that I've quilted into my actual project. I would rather know if there's any problems now. My stitches look good here, so I'm ready to begin. For the free motion quilting on this block, I really wanted to embrace the gift box look 
to the design. So I quilted some long wiggly ribbons in the kind of open sections of the box fabric. And I just did a wavy line and then did a little bit of a angled triangle at the bottom and then echoed that line back. I even crossed over so it would look like the bows were kind of twirling. Then I added a little curvy bow in our little snowballed corners. For the ribbon portion of the quilting, I decided to just kind of make up a little bit of a pattern here. And quilting on your domestic, this is where the ability to rotate your work really comes into its own. I was able to twist this around so that I was working primarily towards and away from myself while quilting these little short lines. I just quilted back and forth in one direction and then I did the same design kind of on a smaller scale and uh, I think it added a lot of interest to the little ribbon sections. I worked my way all the way around the block adding a little swirl in the center of the design and then I was ready to quilt the kind of um, background fabric. Like all the videos of my quilting, this is substantially sped up. The key to quilting on your domestic machine is simply taking your time. It is a little bit slower, but the results are great. You just need to um, be patient with yourself. When it came time to quilt the background of my pillow front, I decided to do a simple meander with a, these little holly leaves inserted randomly. Now, I know that this is a little bit difficult to see with my matching thread. I tried to adjust my lighting, but I've also included a little drawing here in the video to make it a little bit clearer as to how to get this shape. You just wander along with your line, and when you're ready to insert a holly leaf, you just pause and do little C shapes that come back to meet at the line where you began and then you're ready to begin meandering again. It's really simple and really effective for a really cute holiday quilt like this. So my quilt is all done. I had a lot of fun making this quilt. Since it is a relatively small throw size quilt, I think it'll be out on the couch for most of the holiday season. And that little bit of sparkle in the background fabric will reflect those Christmas lights just perfectly. For the back of the quilt, I used a Kona wide back in navy. And I thought it was a really nice neutral touch to kind of the sparkly, <laughs> sparkly print front. And I bound it in a red Kona cotton just for kind of some simplicity. I also made an embroidered label for this quilt. I've been much better about labeling my quilts lately, so I'm trying to stay on top of that by making the label while I'm actually piecing the quilt so I have no excuses to not attach it when I'm uh, done with the binding. I hope you guys enjoyed this layer cake quilt. Um, I think it's the first layer cake I've done for the channel, but it will certainly not be the last. Layer cakes are one of my favorite pre-cuts. If you would like more information on how to complete this pillow, um, I had, did a whole video on how I turn my kind of abandoned quilt blocks and free motion quilting samples into functional pillows, including installing a zipper and everything. So I will put that in a little link in the video right here. If you would like to see more quilty fun, then there are some videos popping up on the screen right now that I think that you will really enjoy. And I will be back in two weeks with another video for you. So I will see you then. Happy quilting. That dog. <laughs>